we're now going to look at the net present value method. And the net present value method isn't difficult. It's not going to take us a long time to talk about it, but it can take a while mathematically because we're going to do a lot of math here. There's a lot of calculations here, especially if the cash flows over the life of the project are different each year. But we'll address that and talk about that. But we need to start by understanding what the net present value method is. And what we're calculating is the net present value of a project, which is nothing more than the present value of the project's future expected cash flows minus the initial cash outflow. We're just looking at what is the net <laughs> present value, very descriptive name here. What is the net present value of this project? We're going to make initial investment, and then we're going to get all these cash flows for the years in the future. We're going to discount those cash flows. We're going to calculate the present value of those future cash inflows and compare it with that initial investment. Okay? We're just adding all of that together. Now that initial investment is made at time zero, so there is no need to calculate the present value of it. Its cash value is the present value. So we're just going to take all of these future cash flows, discount them back to the present, and see what the overall net present value of the project is. Now when we're doing this, we need to calculate that present value which uses an interest rate. So the discount rate that we use is generally the company's required rate of return. And this is what they require from this investment in order for it to be positive. Okay? What minimum return we need in order to justify making this investment. Okay, what is that minimum return that we need? Now, it can also be called the discount rate, the hurdle rate, the opportunity cost of capital. There's different names it may be given, but a common one that you'll see in a question is the required rate of return. Now, this takes us to the question, what interest rate do we use? Well, it's whatever the company wants to use. It is that required rate of return. Sometimes it'll be the weighted average cost of capital for the company. Sometimes it may be the weighted average cost of capital plus a little bit. But however it is that the company determines it, it's the rate that they need to get as a return on this investment. Now one of the things we can do is we can use this rate that we use for our calculations, this required rate of return, we can adjust that rate for risk. Now we'll talk about this a lot more when we talk about risk in capital budgeting, but really what we're saying is the riskier the project, the higher the required rate of return is going to be, risk in return. So if we determine that this project has a lot of risk, we're going to say, well, our required rate of return is going to be a little bit higher because of this additional risk. But again, we'll talk about this later when we talk about risk in capital budgeting. One other thing that we need to know, just kind of keep in our mind as, as a little fact, is that under the net present value method, we're making an assumption that the cash we receive is able to be reinvested at that discount rate that we're using to calculate the net present value. This may not be true, but it's the assumption that we're making. This becomes less likely to be true the higher the discount rate we use. So if we do adjust the discount rate up for risk, well then it's even less likely that we're actually going to be able to invest those cash flows at that really high rate. But this may show up in a question, just kind of an assumption about the net present value method. We're assuming that the cash we receive is able to be reinvested at the discount rate that we are using to calculate the net present value. So, the next step we have is we interpret this. We get this net present value, we get this number. And the interpretation of the net present value is very, very simple based on kind of the name of it. If we have a positive net present value, the net present value is positive some amount of money, that means that the project would be beneficial to the organization. So a positive net present value is, yes, this would be a beneficial investment. On the other hand, if the, net, if the net present value is negative, it means that this project would not be beneficial to the organization, and it's not one that we would consider further. Now, before we go on from this, I just want to say a couple of things here about when we have a negative net present value. Let's pretend we do the math, and it's just a very small negative number, just a little negative number. Well, if we think about all the math that we're doing here and the estimates that we're making about future cash flows, 
If we get a project that has a small negative net present value, we might be able to make that a positive net present value if we just adjusted those future cash flows a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit, $500 a year. And we can make that negative net present value into a positive net present value. Well, we don't want to do that. Okay, now one of the ways to looking at this is if you'd say, well, it's just a little bit negative, it's almost positive. Well, similarly, if we have a net present value that's just a little bit positive, well, all that would have to happen is that our cash flows need to be overstated by $500 each year going forward, and it would become negative. So we don't want to start changing our estimates after we do the net present value math to make that one that's slightly negative into something that's slightly positive. Because that same change would take a slightly positive one into a slightly negative one. Which means realistically, if we do this $13 million investment and we find out that the net present value is $1,752, well, we're probably not going to make that investment. Because yes, there is a net present value of a little bit, but we have to make a huge investment to get it. And so all we have to be off is just a little bit in all of those estimates. And that small positive net present value becomes a very big negative net present value if those estimates turned out to be over, or, you know, overly optimistic. Now another thing too is if we kind of get this negative net present value project, we need to keep in mind that if we were to look at it in six months and reevaluate it in six months, maybe it would change maybe we would be in a better position to take advantage of it. And sometimes I would jokingly say if we have a negative net present value project, we want to give that information to our competitors. Let them make that bad investment. But the thing is, we may look at this investment opportunity and do our assessment, and we may determine it has a net negative present value for us. But another company may look at that and say, wow, this is perfect. This is exactly what we need. If we make this investment, it's going to improve five other areas of our business. So just because it's negative now and negative for us doesn't mean that the same project would have the same negative net present value for another company or if we were to look at it again in six months or a year because maybe circumstances change and those future estimated cash flows become a little bit more positive six months or a year in the future, or another company would be in a better position to capitalize on that investment than we are. So what we're going to do now is we're going to turn our attention to doing a net present value calculation, and we're going to go back to the example that we've already set up, all of those cash flows that we set up. We've calculated the cash flows, we've looked at them, but what we're going to do now is we're going to go all the way through and calculate the net present value of that investment for CMA products. And what we're looking at here is a 10% return. Okay, we've got a 10% return that we need on this. So, if we take our cash flows, okay, we've got this whole example here, all that same information, we don't need to go through it, and we have a 10% required return. So, we start with our cash flows after, or for each year, our after-tax cash flows. We've already calculated all of this, this isn't anything new. Okay, we've got a $150,000 investment, $40,359 in year one, $44,184 in year two, and so on. So those are the total after-tax cash flows. But what we need to do next is we need to calculate the present value of each of those cash flows. We need to calculate the present value of each of those cash flows. And to do this, we need to go to the table. Okay, and this is just copied out of the appendix in the back of the textbook. It's any other present value table. And if you have the a financial calculator, one of the financial calculators that's approved, you can use that as well. But what we're doing is we're going to take the present value table. We had a 10% required rate of return that we set up. And so we're going to use the 10% column. And what we're interested in are the nine years at 10%. And so 0 0.909, 0 0.826, 0 0.751, these are the table values that we're going to multiply each individual year's cash flows by. So, taking those numbers off the table, putting them back into our table, and year zero is or multiplied by one because it's, there's no time value there. It's happening at year zero. So, we have the present value factor off the table for each of the cash flows, and we do the math, and we get the discounted cash flow for each individual year. Okay? Now, we have the discounted 
cash flow, those net present value cash flows for each year. And so next we calculate the cumulative discounted cash flows. Okay, and we saw this when we were talking about the payback period, somewhere there between in, during year five, it switches from a negative cumulative cash flow to a positive. But we look all the way over there at year nine, and if we add up all the cash flows, the discounted cash flows, the cumulative discounted cash flows at the end of year nine are 92,193 positive. That's it. That's the net present value of this project. We're done. We've calculated the net present value. So the conclusion, taking it to the last step, is that this project is acceptable to CMA products because the net present value is positive. This project is acceptable because the net present value is positive. And this is how we calculate the net present value. This is just kind of the standard, straightforward net present value calculation. We've got all of the individual years. Each of those individual years is multiplied by the present value table factor, table value. We calculate the discounted cash flows for each period. We add all of those up and we come up with our net present value of that investment. This is the standard net present value calculation. You need to be able to do it. You're not going to have a question on the exam that's nine years, okay? because that's just a massive calculator exercise. You might be given a few years that you have to do that for to make a couple of calculations, you know how to use the table, know how the, the table values change each year, but you're not going to have to do nine years. Don't worry about that. That's just kind of the example in showing all the different things we need to show. But it's each individual cash flow, which we calculate. You know how to do that. Okay, that's those relevant cash flows, those expected relevant cash flows after tax. And now we're just adjusting those, calculating the present value of those, discounting all of those future cash flows back to the initial investment, adding them all up and comparing them to the in initial investment. If it's positive, the project is beneficial to the organization. If it's negative, then that project is not beneficial to the organization. And that is the standard net present value process. What we're going to look at next, we're going to take some time and look at some slightly different situations about calculating net present value, but we'll take a look at those separately.